Fast Forward Productions. The women are speaking. The best I can offer in my tiny little corner that I occupy here is to let yourself fall in love with the world in general and especially with the natural world. And that if you see the world as your lover and the natural world as your lover and your beloved, you're not going to do bad things to it. <laughs> Welcome to The Good Dirt, old listeners and new. When you hear this, we'll be on break for the joyful occasion of Emma's wedding celebration. But don't worry, we think you'll enjoy what we've got in store for you. Yes, we've gone back and selected a few episodes that you don't want to miss. Whether or not you've heard them before or are catching them for the first time, it's a reminder of what we were thinking and talking about two years ago when the world was in a very different place as was some of our sound technology, but that's okay. We love reflecting on how far we've come in so many ways, how we've evolved in our production, and how we've brought the inspiration from these past conversations forward into life as we know it today. So here we go with a retrospective episode from 2021 in its entirety, intro and all. So listen up now for some of the best of The Good Dirt. You're listening to the Good Dirt Podcast. This is a place where we dig into the nitty gritty of sustainable living through food, fashion, and lifestyle. And we're your hosts, Mary and Emma Kingsley, the mother and daughter founder team of Lady Farmer. We're sowing seeds of slow living through our community platform, events, and online marketplace. We started this podcast as a means to share the wealth of information and quality conversations that we're having in our world as we dream up and deliver ways for each of us to live into the new paradigm, one that is regenerative, balanced, and whole. We want to put the microphone in front of the voices that need to be heard the most right now. The farmers, the dreamers, the designers, and the doers. So come cultivate a better world with us. We're so glad you're here. Now, let's dig in. Lady Farmer Guide to Slow Living. A whole year. Wow. Yeah. And it, it came out last year, right as everything shut down with COVID, right at the same time. Quite aptly timed. We did not do that on purpose. No, no. And another remarkable thing about it was that that book was actually really, like, really ready to be put out into the world a good while before that. But we had kind of held on to it for no real reason. We didn't know. We just weren't quite ready to put it out. And we kind of randomly, at one point, I think in 2019, we thought, let's do March 2020 will be a good time for this book. Yeah. <laughs> Which is creepy. I know. There were so many obstacles along the way, and it just kept getting put off and put off. And then there mm -hmm. it was, cultivating sustainable simplicity close to home. It's really amazing. And that was such wow. a fun like launch of that book. Remember packing them all up? We had like a couple hundred pre-orders and we packed them all up in our living room and everyone got postcards. And so we're just thinking about that right now for all of you early adopters <laughs> and yes. um, anyone who's bought the book over the past year and shared the book and lent the book out. Yes, it is still available to purchase if you're interested on our website. And we're trying to get it into more bookstores too, local bookstores, as those things start to open up again. So if you have an idea of a bookstore that you think would like to stock it, then let us know. Or you can even go into your bookstore and request it, and they should be able to order it from their distributors. So let's get the Lady Farmer Guide to Still Living out to the world. Yes. So Emma, I have a question for you. Can you tell about an experience in your life when something inside you said, I have arrived, meaning you knew you'd encountered something that was going to be very meaningful to you from that time forward. Can you describe an experience like that? 
Yeah, I think there have been a few. The first one that comes to my head is actually when I started at my new high school, when I switched between sophomore and junior year. Really? Yeah. Well, I would say maybe even not exactly starting, but the first time I visited and I knew like, oh, I really want to be here. And I guess I didn't know that I would be definitely going there or anything, but it really felt like this is going to be a special time for me. And it really was. This was a very special two years. Yes. And it, it really did kind of determine certain directions in your life. It really did kind of speak to everything that came after in a way. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Kind of that's nerdy, but... <laughs> and this is kind of creepy. I'll share this. Nine months before that, when we didn't know we were moving, it was Catherine Vogel's birthday party. Shout out to Catherine Vogel. And we went oh. to a restaurant and there was a tarot card reader sitting in the corner. It was a cool downtown Atlanta restaurant. And we all had our fortunes told. And I remember she <laughs> said, are you starting at a new school soon? And I was like, no. <laughs> and then we were like, yeah, she doesn't know what she's talking about. Isn't that weird? That's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Anyways. So what about you? What, do, what do, Have you had an experience like that? Well, like you, I could probably think of a few, but the one that I thought at first when I was thinking about this question was, I guess now about nine years ago when we lived in DC on these beautiful mornings, I would get up and drive out here to the ag reserve to the pick your own places, one in particular, right up the street to get whatever vegetables were in season. And I I did that a lot. I did that most summer weekends and it was one June morning and I took a right onto the road that leads straight to this farm And the wind was blowing and there was some grasses in the field that were just blowing a certain way in the wind and the light. And this feeling really came over me that said, I I need to be here. I need to live here. It was really strong. And I felt like, you know, I have arrived home. This is where I need to live. And I thought to myself, I bet there's something for sale out here and went home after that. And sure enough, went online and there was this house, this little farm. It was right there. You know, the rest of the story. Yeah. I also remember when we went to go look at that for the first time, it was me and my brother and you, it wasn't actually an official like appointment. You just drove us past it. And both me and my brother were like, oh, wow, this is really special. Mom. I think we both felt it. It's a special place. So I ask this question because it's an important piece of our conversation today with our guest, Eliza Blue. She's a singer, a songwriter, and a mom. And she had her own arrival experience when she walked into a friend's lambing barn at lambing season. And this became the gateway to the life she's now living. Eliza is also a writer who now lives and works on a regeneratively managed ranch raising grass-fed cattle and fiber sheep with her rancher husband and two children. She wrote a book about it called Accidental Rancher, came out this past spring, and she also writes and produces audio postcards about ranch life for the North Dakota and South Dakota NPR affiliates. And she just finished filming for a new series that celebrates rural life through stories and songs called Wish You Were Here. Yes. And I feel like this interview is really special in another way as well. It's the way in which we touched on regenerative farming. It's usually something that's talked about in scientific terms, kind of like soil composition and methodology and that sort of thing. But Eliza, being an artist, beautifully articulates a more spiritual side of this topic, which is something that resonates tremendously with me personally. And I would even describe it as another one of those arrival experiences when I first began learning about regenerative agriculture and what it meant in terms of healing and all of the connectedness of the earth and ourselves and the soil and the land. And that began a real personal journey for me that incorporates living out here and incorporates Lady Farmer and all that we do and talk about. Yeah, we really love talking to Eliza. It felt much like reconnecting with a kindred spirit. We definitely felt like we knew her already. I've just loved listening to her music. You can find her on Spotify. We'll link her in the show notes and her postcards from the NPR special. It's just really lovely. And of course, listening to her talk and tell her story is just wonderful. So we will stop introducing her and 
let you in and we'll get to it. Thank you for being here. So when people ask me where I'm from, it's actually a hard question to answer. (laughs) I was born in Detroit, Michigan, and lived in a suburb of Detroit till I was about 13. Then my family moved to Minnesota, went to high school there, moved to the East Coast for college, kind of wound my way around the East Coast post-college, figuring out what I was doing, made my way back west and lived and worked in Minneapolis. At that point, I actually was touring a lot, so I was sort of on the road a lot, and then eventually got pretty burned out of the touring life and moved to this tiny town on the prairie in western South Dakota. Supposed to be a temporary adventure. I was just kind of coming out, kind of catch my breath, figure out what I was going to do next. And then, you know, the oldest story in the book fell in love with a rancher and uh, a cowboy. (laughs) We got married and now we have two little kids. And I live and work on a regeneratively managed cattle and sheep ranch in one of the most remote counties in the contiguous United States. So I always joke that I am as surprised as anyone that I'm here. (laughs) It definitely was unexpected. Sort of every step along the way has been surprising, but pretty early on in the time here, you know, I was teaching English and living in town, but I went out to visit some friends ranch at lambing time and I walked into the lambing barn. I've never experienced anything quite like it. I felt like I was arriving and, you know, the barn is all full of this fresh straw and there was all these moms and babies. And I was just like, this is the best thing that's ever happened. (laughs) That ranch, you know, if they have a mom that's sick or can't take care of the babies, there's sometimes if you have twins and the mom doesn't have enough milk or triplets, they'll take a baby and we call them bottle lambs and you'll just raise them, you know, on a bottle instead. So this ranch, they would, you know, have all these bum lambs or bottle lambs every year. So that first spring, I just fell so in love and I was kind of like, well, if you ever need help, you know, I'll help however I can. So I ended up getting two bottle lambs from them which, you know, most people, they have their bottle lambs and then it kind of returns to the flock. But of course, me being me, they became my pets. Like I had a dog door that they'd stick their (laughs) heads through. So I kind of had to make this decision. Am I going to stay here and keep teaching? Or, you know, at that point I knew, I was like, I don't know where I'm going to end up next, but I know that the lambs have to come now. We're a family. So they were like my gateway into ranching. And then the third grade class in town had, you know, an incubator with eggs and then they hatched out all these baby chicks and I was like who wants some chicks and I was like oh I'll take them so and then I had to build a coop and so yeah that's how it, how it started again became pretty clear right away that I was like this is what I want I want to have this life taking care of animals and all the chores that go with it I'd never experienced anything like it I mean I didn't have any farming background. Nobody in my family was a farmer. I had never been around that at all. But I don't know, maybe it's in the the genes because it just all felt very familiar. Or maybe it was from reading so many uh, Little House on the Prairie (laughs) books as a kid. Yeah. I know. I was going to say your life. It's even this yeah. is the first part describing it. I'm like, where can I watch this movie? Or like, have I seen this movie? It's so familiar, but also so fantastical. It's so cool. It's such a great story. You know, we hear that over and over again about, and it's kind of like myself, no background in it or no knowledge, but you know, you find yourself entering that world and it just feels so right and nourishing. We've all been so disconnected from the land and from nature and all that. Then when we let ourselves go there, it just, it feels... Mm-hmm great. <laughs> Feels wonderful. It's, of course, not everybody could move like we did. We we left the city and moved out to the farm and you moved out to the prairie and stayed and not everybody can do that. But there's lots of ways of reconnecting as we like to tell people. Yeah. And it's so funny how it just happened to you. And you say you're an accidental rancher. Yeah. So I wrote a book that came out last spring and that is the title of the book because it really did feel sort of accidental. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh, I guess I'm doing this now. <laughs> I was going to say, it's so wonderful how you've been able to keep a part of that touring musician, creative part of yourself and really infuse that in your work and share what you're doing there with the world. And you've done that in a few different ways. So you have the book that you wrote and you have your postcards from the prairie. Can you tell us about that project and sort of the other creative projects that you have sort of blossoming out of your life there? When I first moved out here, like I said, I was teaching and I was still 
touring in the summers and still traveling quite a bit from here. But when I sort of officially got married, by this time accumulated a bunch of animals that needed care and then had children who also need care. (laughs) Um, It (laughs) just became clear that I couldn't tour like I had been. So I was like, just feeling like I needed to have a creative outlet. So I started writing a little column for our town paper, just kind of about life on the ranch and, you know, the transition to being new to this life and funny stories about all the mistakes I made. And it just took off. People really enjoyed it. So the next thing I knew, I think I had 10 or 11 different papers that were carrying it. And South Dakota Magazine had approached me about doing some writing for them. And so I had created this manuscript. I'd been kind of messing around with this book and just thought, this is the beginning stage and I don't know anything about writing a book, but I gave it to the editor at South Dakota Magazine saying, like, do you have any advice for me? And she was like, yeah, I think we should just publish it. I think it's good. (laughs) Similarly, with the postcards from the prairie, South Dakota Public Broadcasting had just interviewed me and had me do a couple different things for them with music. And because I have recording equipment here, just from, you know, doing demos and different things, and the album before last, I actually recorded myself as well. So because I had the technology, I just sort of pitched it to them like, what if I did these little monthly snapshots of life? And, you know, I'm I'm writing this column anyway, but why don't I just record it and I can add a little music? So I started making those for them. And then Prairie Public, which is the public radio affiliate in North Dakota and Minnesota, picked it up. And now I'm actually doing a TV show with them that's sort of a similar theme. And I just think you know, much like being an accidental rancher, it keeps surprising me. But I mean, it's related to what we've already said. I think people just crave those stories. They want to hear those stories. It's very thrilling. And it's it's very validating to have your work be appreciated. And I mean, I feel like I actually don't have much to contribute to the world of ranching. Like I'm a pretty terrible rancher. <laughs> Because I want everything to be like a pet. I like, I I get it. (laughs) I don't read that part. And I'm, I'm a really bad gardener. I'm a terrible farmer because sort of the same thing. I'm like, oh, we don't want to pull up those little weeds. Like you might be something we'll love. (laughs) My husband, thankfully, is a good rancher. (laughs) But I feel like what I can contribute, especially when we think about this sort of change that I feel like we're witnessing. This was kind of revelatory to me recently when I was thinking about the word agriculture agriculture has the word culture in it and we don't think about it we've switched over to this mentality i think because of industrialized farming and industrial agriculture where we think of farming and ranching as being sort of scientific and especially if it's not something you grew up with which i didn't and now with regenerative agriculture there's beautiful and amazing science about soil health and i love reading about all that stuff but the truth is i'm not a scientist so i'm not going to be able to contribute much to that discussion but i just started thinking about the culture of agriculture is also the poetry is also the music of place and of the earth and so that's where i feel like i have something to offer in telling these stories so much of that kind of the pastoral narrative is this throwback to how things used to be. And I mean, even here, I feel people think back to how it used to be and they miss the community that used to exist just because of the way we farm and ranch now. It's on such a bigger scale. There's less human beings and people miss each other. I feel like it's my purpose is doing the storytelling of the modern agriculturalist and that relationship with the earth can have a spiritual aspect and certainly can have a creative and an artistic aspect. That was, again, a new idea for me, even just within the past couple of years of recognizing like, wow, this is what people are hungry for. And I am hungry for, I mean, this is the stuff I wanted to read before I moved out here. I mean, I was writing songs about working on a ranch before I worked on a ranch because that, that narrative was so powerful. I think there's such a place for what you're describing is expressing a soul connection Whereas the recent culture of farming has been more of a brain or business connection. And as we talk about it so much, it's become such an industry over the last hundred years, say, really lost our soul connection to it. You're pulling out the poetry, you're pulling out the stories and all those things that I think we're hungry for as human beings, because we're of the land, whether or not we live on it or farm it or work it because we are of the land. There's no denying that we always have been. So I love what you're saying about telling the stories. And I was going to 
invite you to to tell one of your story. You know, if you can think of one, just share right here. So most of my best stories are about lambs wearing diapers <laughs> and living in the house and all the shenanigans that occur. Or similarly, I think it was two falls ago, we had one of our hens get broody and go hide her eggs. All our chickens are free range, which is, again, I mean, it's not how you're supposed to do it. They're just everywhere. When they decide they want to hatch out their eggs, there's not much we can do about it because we often can't find them. They'll go into these grassy areas or they'll find, you know, spots that they're very good at hiding themselves is what I'm trying to say. And they'll just sit out there and then all of a sudden they'll reappear with this hatch of chicks. It's like, oh, okay, well, I guess we have more chickens now. But we had that happen in October. And the day she came out, which usually they don't do, usually the hens have a pretty good sense of what they can accomplish and do a better job of timing it. But she came out and it just happened to be, we'd had this sort of like long, warm spell. And then the day that it just got cold and it was like she emerged from the brush and it was snowing. Oh. And I was just like, oh, no. And so I was trying to catch her and I was going to bring her in and I was just freaking her out. And she only had hatched three babies. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is a disaster. But she was so protective. And I was just like, all right, I've got to make a tough decision here. Like I can take these babies and I can become their mom, or I can trust her to be a able to take care of them. And this is a call you have to make more than you think. What I was talking about with bum lambs, where you have to decide, this mom seems like she's maybe not doing a great job. Like maybe she's having some kind of problems, but you you can't have a chat about it. So it's not always obvious what is happening. And if you take a baby away from a mom, like they just aren't going to thrive. They won't do as well. There's all kinds of different reasons, but you know, it's, it's clearly not what nature is intended. So in that instance, I decided I was going to let the mom try to do it. It was so beautiful. So for the next month through very cold weather, she's a buff Orpington, which if you know chicken breeds, they're kind of a peachy color and they're pretty big. And so she would just fluff herself out huge with her wings and she would just sail through the yard like that. And the three little chicks would kind of be under the umbrella of her feathers and she would take them around and let them, you know, hunt and peck. And then every, I don't know, five or six minutes, she'd just sit down and they go under her and she'd warn them. Wow. And then they'd get back up and she'd go back out, you know, hunting for whatever. It was so impressive. She raised these three chicks so they were healthy and happy and did great. I feel like that's one of the hardest parts of the job though, is when to trust the systems that nature has put into place because you can't always, I mean, I've made the wrong call plenty of times too, and that's heartbreaking, but you know, back to the industrial versus non-industrial, especially for those of us who work with animals as opposed to growing plants. The people here who have been doing this for generations, they have a wealth of knowledge that I just feel like they don't get credit for. I don't even think they realize how amazing the work they do is in terms of having the sense of exactly what I just described, to know when to intervene, to know when to take a step back. And industrial agriculture or not, like that's something that as a rancher, you're going to be making those calls all the time on whatever scale you're doing it. And it's especially right now, we're about to go into lambing and calving. And it is a super intense time because you're basically a midwife for these animals, which you want to, you know, let it happen naturally, let, you know, their bodies know how to do it. But sometimes things don't go well and you have to step in. Like we like to let our sheep and our cows when possible have their babies out in the pasture because there's less germs and they are more relaxed just standing back and letting them do their thing. That's the best way to do it. But sometimes, you know, if somebody's having a problem, and again, you can't always tell when that's happening and then you have to bring them in the barn. But if you bring them in too soon, then they can get stressed. There's just a lot of different things that can go wrong once you start intervening. But that's the job. (laughs) And it can happen in the middle of the night, in the middle of a snowstorm. I mean, like it just, you never know. You have to just be ready for anything. Yes, and speaking of the natural systems, going back to the chickens a minute, How do you keep the predators from eating all your chickens? We've gone from 15 chickens to five just since last spring, (laughs) because we like to let our chickens out too and let them just run around. But it's the the attrition rate is enormous, but you know, that's nature. (laughs) Yeah. And the first few years that I had chickens, I had coops and I had runs because I kept losing them. My neighbor, I think he had 25 chickens and they got picked off one by one because there was an owl. But I basically got a livestock guard dog for my chickens. Yeah. (laughs) And it worked. So I have a great Pyrenees. So we've got this owl that will fly around our yard all the time, but she sees it 
even during the day and she'll just bark at it and it flies away so it doesn't mess with stuff. And I lost so many chickens to coons. They were so sneaky and foxes during the day even. So so we'd have them in the coop and shut in the coop at night and they'd still be getting taken during the day. Yeah. And so we got this garden dog and now I haven't lost a chicken from a predator since we've had her, which is five years. Oh, wow. Five years without, uh, wow. Yeah. We've talked and talked about getting um, a guard dog, but we've heard they just live outside and they're not, you know, they're pets, but they're not really pets. They don't come in and all that. And that would be really different for us. I don't know. This was also a little joke because of my uh, propensity to turn everything into pets. My husband was like a hundred percent sure that she would end up in the house and that there was no way she was going to be able to be a livestock guard dog because there was no way I would let her be. Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, no, no, we've got to protect the chickens. I'm going to remain strong. And because it was summertime, it was a lot easier to be cavalier about her sleeping outside. But it came obvious really quick that, I mean, this is the thing about dog breeds. It was mind blowing. That was her job. And she knew it from birth, a beautiful and friendly dog. But she's very unconcerned with us most of the time. Last week when it was negative 30. She comes in then. I mean, she has a dog house she can sleep in. I was like, that's too cold. So she comes in and she sleeps in the house when it's that cold. But most of the time she doesn't want to because she's working at night. That's her busy time. <laughs> and we have a lot of coyotes around here. We'll hear them howling again, like all around the ranch. She'll just spend the whole night just walking around and barking and keeping them from coming into our pastures. And I'd never forget when she was a puppy, she was old enough that she wasn't in the roly poly phase, but still pretty small. And a hawk flew over our house, just passing by. And she just went crazy barking and chasing it. And I was like, how does she know to look to the sky? And like, we have birds flying over all the time. How could she tell the difference between a hawk and like, I don't know, a goose, but she can isn't that amazing? Yeah. You know, we have a little shepherd dog. She's, she's just about a year and a half old and I cannot say that we have not lost chickens since we've had her. So, <laughs> and, and she barks at birds, but I, she's such a pet. I mean, that's the difference. She, you know, she comes in and she. What, what kind of shepherd is she? She's half Aussie, half border collie. And then her dad was an English setter. She's this crazy combination. She's very much a bird dog, but she hasn't kept the whatever it is away from our chickens. I actually have an English shepherd, which okay. is pretty much like an Australian shepherd, very similar. I mean, again, it, it's so amazing to me. Pretty much every night I walk right around evening time and I'll walk out north and you'll start to hear the coyotes howl. Yeah. And when they do, my great Pyrenees and my English shepherd, they'll walk with me and you start to hear them. The great Pyrenees takes off barking. The English shepherd stays with me because she thinks her job is to take care of me. And the Great Pyrenees, all of this is my domain and no one's coming in here that I don't want in here. The English Shepherd, she'll sleep outside the door if, if she's outside. Right now I have the door to this room closed because otherwise she just like will come and sleep by my feet because she thinks it's her job to take care of me, which it kind of is. Yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah. Oh, that's amazing. They're all, they're, they're so wise. There's so much going on in those animals. It's just so wonderful. But I wanted to talk about one of your stories that really resonated with me, one of the postcards where you had said it was such a desire when you were a young girl to have a horse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Back in the 60s, that was just my dream. We kind of lived near this barn and I would go to the barn and just hang out with my friends that had horses. But my parents just, they was like, no, like we're not doing the horse thing. No, no. And now it's a joke. I mean, I had a wonderful childhood. I was deprived of nothing except a horse. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we moved out here eight years ago, these two really, really old horses, I mean, they were both in their 30s, came with the property. If you're going to buy this, you have to have these horses because they have nowhere else to go. Sorry. <laughs> and so we go, okay. And, and so my dad thought we were crazy for doing this anyway, for buying this little farm. You know, we were sending him pictures and stuff, and his comment was, well, you finally got a horse. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like you, too, and then the older I got, you know, I was kind of scared to ride a horse, and I still don't want to ride a horse. I'm in my 60s now. I don't. I have no business, like, getting on a horse now, but it's just funny. Your story was so similar to mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I go back and forth even now because I, I think I wrote it last summer because my daughter, who is four— and this goes back to like, could this be coded in our DNA? My son is not interested in horses, but my daughter from birth, she just would see horses and get excited. And 
by a year and a half was wanting to get on a horse, which I was like, oh my gosh, no, that's too scary. But so she is now four. It, my husband will lead them and she'll, you know, sit on a full size horse. It's very terrifying to me. And I, it's really beautiful because she loves it so much. So she's getting that chance to do what I didn't, which is to learn how to do it when you're not scared. <laughs> you know, her body is whenever still like smushy enough that if she falls, she's not going to be like in a full body cast, <laughs> which I feel like I've now, you know, I'm in my forties. I feel like I'm reaching that point where it's like, yeah, I don't want to fall off a horse anymore. When I was 20, I guess that would have been fine, but maybe not now. They were surrounded in our community with, you know, horse enthusiasts and people reach a certain age where they think they're done. And it's usually after a bad fall or something. Yeah. Well, cause that happens. One of the other big topics I write about is the distance between how things appear in literature or movies and then the reality of them. And when you're dealing with a living creature, like it's having its own experience <laughs> and it sees something that's freaky and it's not like a bad horse. All the horses here are wonderful, sweet animals. And if they see something that startles them, which horses get startled a lot, they'll jump. And if you're not like a, you know, a strong rider, that's how you fall off. It's not because they're being bad or trying to buck you off or something like that. It can be pretty intimidating, yeah. but this is something I do want to share with my daughter. I want to be able to go on rides with her. So I'm really pushing myself. You're so isolated, I guess, and remote and where you are and you're, you seem like such a self-reliant person. I'm wondering if 2020 and the pandemic and, and, and all of that had any like real effect on your life. And if so, like what that was like for you? Well, the irony of the pandemic has been that it's actually made our world expand in a way. Having Zoom has changed my life. We started an arts council, a small group of us, and this was actually pre-pandemic, and it was kind of going to just be to serve these communities. And like for our region, you know, I'm talking like a couple hundred miles radius. That was the group we were serving, which is, I don't know, 500 people. It's, it's not very many people. <laughs> but anyway, the South Dakota Arts Council ended up forming this committee that I got to be on and do all this work with. They had planned to have it be something where people would meet at a central location and, you know, have these meetings, and which I could never have done. I mean, that's one of the things about ranch life. You just can't leave very often. There's too much work to do that has to be done every day. I mean, like you can't just take a break from feeding stuff or, you you know, giving things water. But because there are now virtual offerings for so many different conferences and meetings, I feel like I've learned so much and connected so much with other people living in rural areas, other people interested in sort of this work and this lifestyle. It's been awesome. And today, my daughter, my four-year-old just took her first virtual ballet class, which she has been wanting to do forever. <laughs> if I wanted to take her to a ballet class, we'd have to drive two and a half hours. But that's the closest place you could take a ballet class. So that's pretty great, right? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. Oh my gosh. I'm reflecting on that, you know, how my kids were raised in the suburb. And so much time was spent just going around in the car and even not just my kids activities, but our own activities, you know, meetings and book clubs. And I've been reflecting on that recently after a year of being home and there's no less meetings actually. There's probably, probably more, more <laughs> but we don't leave. And it's amazing how it has just changed. You can like eat dinner and clean up the kitchen and five minutes later be sitting at your meeting. You know, that's so different from the way it was. You like it? Do you feel like it's better? It suits my personality so much. But yeah, it does. I definitely get screen fatigue and I'm such an extrovert. I love being with people. So I miss that. But I can imagine the kind of access it's given you and your family and people in your situation. Yeah, you all are so isolated. And th the idea of driving, you know, two and a half hours to a, a dance lesson, which, you know, you would want your daughter to be exposed to. That makes me so sad. I can like walk down my street and then go to a dance lesson. <laughs> I, used to, I used to drive Emma about, you know, 12 minutes to her ballet every day, every day. <laughs> I spent a lot of time in the car back in the 90s, a whole lot. <laughs> Well, that was my mom too. I mean, we lived in the suburb and she always joked that being a mom when your kids are older is basically just being a chauffeur. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Like his day was when we were old enough to get our license so we could start chauffeuring ourselves. She'd be like, yes, see you later. <laughs> I want to talk to you a little bit about your music because it's funny. I feel like on this podcast, I'm bringing up a lot of things. I want to do that with my life. And this is what I want to do. But one of those many things is being a folk singer. I love your type of music and what you sing. And when I sing, I gravitate towards 
the Jillian Welch and all that sort of brand. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about your music, how you got started in that and what inspires you in your songwriting. And And I will add that Emma's older brother is a touring musician. Yeah. We have that in our family. Oh, so, yeah. It is a hard time to be a musician, not just because of the pandemic, but because of the way music is selling now with yeah. streaming services. So when I first started out, still very hard to make a living, but you didn't have to be famous. You could, you know, play sort of the coffee house circuit, which yeah. for my style of music is, you know, that's kind of what you'd be doing. You'd be playing more intimate shows. It's not like pop or rock and roll or something. And because for me too, that was the music I was drawn to. And and when I first started, I had terrible, terrible stage fright. So I was writing these songs and singing and I taught myself to play guitar so I could you know, accompany myself, but I never played them in public. And that took a pretty long time to find the courage, but it just, I don't know, it's funny. I don't like to throw around things like say it's my calling because I'm not even really sure what that means. The impulse to do it was so intense that it allowed me to break through this fear of being rejected, I guess. I'm not sure of, of putting myself out there. The desire to do it was more powerful than the very powerful feeling of not wanting to do it. <laughs> so somehow I, I just started doing open mics and, you know, started opening for people. And then it just kind of built in, you know, a, a circuit of places to play. And again, back then mm -hmm. it was like, you'd put out a CD and you'd maybe not get paid a ton of money to play the show, but you'd sell your albums as a way to, you know, make it to the next town. It was very hard and very wonderful. I, I had just a lot of friends who were also in that industry. It was so free and freeing and wonderful to have this sort of road life. The way I feel about being with the land now and that relationship, it's like weird when you're a touring musician because you kind of have that relationship with the highway where it's like, it's very zen. I don't know. It, it's a very strange lifestyle, but it was very fulfilling in some ways. And mm -hmm. it was very stressful because of money and because of have, not having like any roots. I remember a friend saying like, I'm making enough money that I don't have to quit, but I'm not making enough that I can quit. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard. I think that the strain of kind of just feeling like every month that passed, you were just like, is this enough that I'm not going to make enough money to keep doing this? The other big difference that now feels just like absolute luxury is that when you are living off of the money you're making by selling something that's like artistic or creative, you have to be so much more concerned with how it's being received. And that is another strain on the creative process. And it just really changes the dynamic. If you have to create content that is going to sell, whereas now, and again, like this has been the beautiful part about the last few years of my life, you know, that I was able to write just what I wanted to write. And I didn't have to worry if people were going to like it or not like it. And then they did, which was wonderful and really validating, like on a soul level. So then the same has happened with my music now, because I don't have to make a living from touring. The songs I write have really changed, or I shouldn't even say that actually, I don't know if they have changed that much, as much as my process of writing has changed. Yeah, And your relationship to them, you're not depending on them to support you. It's like a kid or a baby animal. You don't ask the baby lamb to take care of you. <laughs> it just feels like before there was, you know, like a lot of artists, you, you want to be in integrity. You want to be authentic. You want to be like creating, you know, using your own unique voice. But you have to push through all the like, but what if people don't like my unique voice? What if people don't think this is cool enough or whatever? And you spend so much time trying to market yourself or brand yourself. I mean, it's just this very time consuming, emotionally exhausting process. And now I get to just write a song. And if people are into mm -hmm. it, great. If they aren't, that's fine too. I don't have to worry all the time about how it's going to be received. And predictably, my songwriting is much better. <laughs> what does that look like now? Are you just, you write songs for fun and are you putting out albums? Are you producing it yourself? What does that look like? And how can people find your music? Um, well, here's another story that's almost too crazy to be real. But okay. <laughs> so I had sort of decided like, okay, you know, I had my son and I was like, I'm not going to record any more albums. It's a pretty big expense to go into a studio. And I'd recorded an album at home, but I was like, I just can't do that with a baby. And then I found out that 
this musician had moved to our area and was living on a ranch about 40 miles from here, which is close. <laughs> so his name is Billy Talbot. He's the bass player for Crazy Horse, Neil Young's band. And I was like, well, you know, just like everybody else. Well, that's crazy that Neil Young's bass player lives here. That's kind of random and funny. And then I ended up meeting him at like a, a neighboring ranch's barbecue. <laughs> Of course, starstruck a little bit. Like someone else is like, "Oh, she's a musician too. You guys should be friends." And it was, I'm like, "Oh no, <laughs> like that type of thing." But you know, by by virtue of the fact that you know, that's just like everybody here. I mean, neighbors are neighbors. He was like, "Oh, you should come over sometimes." So I did, and we kind of jammed around. And anyway, it turned out that he had built a building on his land to be a recording studio, and he was recorded a couple of solo albums, which he asked me to perform on, and that was over several years. And then I got the courage up to ask him if he would help me record an album. So I was able to record my last album actually at his recording studio, which no way, which was by far the best sound of any of my other <laughs> albums. And like, you know, yeah. I had a famous rock star produce and record my, my last album. Yeah. And you're like, he's a friend and you're comfortable. And it was like, yeah. Wow. It was just insane. Like, even as it was happening, I was like, I moved to this unbelievably remote place I think I'm gonna have to give up my music career and then end up having an opportunity to record with someone that's far more famous and just I mean his body of experience like over decades of working with you know industry professionals it's just it, it, I just you know that's what happened when you let go of it having to be this thing uh, that that's amazing. I, that's really so interesting. I can relate a little bit. No, I can relate a lot with my writing. Yeah, I've written a couple of novels and you know essays and a lot of different things. And in the earlier days of it, it was just it was terrifying, and I dreaded a review that you know for my book that wasn't good, and and it was just kind of torturous. And then I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I just like really didn't care, and it just felt like. Uh, obligation to write a story or put something out that was sort of in me. It was like, this thing has to be out there. And once I've done that, then how it's received or whatever really doesn't matter. So I had to mature into that. And I mean, it'd be great if, you know, suddenly one of my books was a bestseller or something. That'd be great. But it just really doesn't matter. I mean, <laughs> if, if I have a story and I want to set aside some of my life to tell it, then I've done my job. That's the way I feel. Well, and I agree. Again, back to having a calling. I feel like we all have different strengths and it, it is good to push yourself and challenge yourself and all of that. But especially getting older, I feel like, you know, as I'm now in this period of what is hopefully the middle of my life, <laughs> I have such a stronger feeling of where my strengths are and my gifts are. And, and so, yeah, it's, it is, it's like, it's my job to t write these stories or sing these stories. It's not my job to market these stories. It's not my job to sell these stories to you. It's just my job to write them or to sing them. And then whatever happens next to them, it's fine. I couldn't feel that way in my, my twenties and even my thirties. Yeah. I just, I wanted people to like me <laughs> and I still yeah. do. I just don't feel like that's my job anymore. <laughs> what a relief. It is a big, huge relief. It's Oh, well, the other side of that coin though, it, I was in town yesterday because Emma lives in town and we were doing some lady farmer stuff and I ran into an old neighbor and she said, Oh, I really liked your book. Have you written any more? And I said, well, yeah, I have, you know, and they're, they're out there, they're on Amazon or whatever. And she said, well, I haven't seen any marketing of it or anything. And I said, yeah, because there hasn't been. And then she said, you should market your book. And I thought, well, I probably should. Would you like to help me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's where, that's like where I, how I've come with it, you know, okay. I've, put the thing out there and then kind of, you know, went on with other things, but gee whiz. <laughs> Life is short enough. The older you get, it's easier to tell the chaff from the wheat because you've had more experience of chasing after the chaff, I guess. And that's different for every individual, but I definitely feel like that. It's like, I could do a better job of marketing myself. Absolutely. Especially on social media. I could be doing a way better job. I just don't want to. I would rather be writing. I would rather be out in the garden, I would rather be, you know, like running around with the kids and dogs. And and so that's the choice I make. And it means that, yeah, I'm 
things I put out aren't going to be as successful. And I don't know, there are definitely times where I, I wish that they were more successful, but apparently I don't wish it bad <laughs> enough to do something about it. <laughs> There's something to also trusting that like it'll get to the people who need to hear it. But also if anyone's listening and would like to be either uh, Mary Kingsley or Eliza Blue's publicity agent, <laughs> we're open, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. We are hiring free interns here. <laughs> we can't leave this discussion with talking to you about your involvement with regenerative agriculture out there where you are. I would love to hear even how you would explain regenerative agriculture because some people, that it's a new term for them. A lot of people, it's a new term for them. And they say, what is that? I feel like I'm not the person to talk about sort of the science of regenerative agriculture. And there are some people who are doing absolutely amazing work in our area. But Gabe Brown up in North Dakota, he's just amazing. And he's sort of a pioneer in that field just in general, but especially around here. But one of the things that I feel like is really interesting to me from the perspective of someone who was living in an urban area, reading things like the omnivores dilemma. That was sort of my introduction to the concept of soil health and Joel Salton's work, and also sort of the idea of industrial agriculture and the industrialized food chain or supply chain. And so I was really shocked when I came out here to discover that, so where we live, which is, you know, the grasslands, and because of our kind of extreme climate, people grow crops here, but it's dry land crops because there isn't really a way to irrigate. And it's so windy and our topography is very rocky. And I mean, we're not the foothills for anything, but it's kind of more of that sort of geology. So it's just not great for crops is what I'm trying to say. But it is really great for growing grass. So all the ranchers here, they might do a little bit of finishing on grain, but most of the people run 100% grass-fed or vast majority grass-fed operations. Now they sell their calves and they get sent somewhere else where they get, you know, finished in feedlots or wherever. It depends on who buys it. I don't have solutions for these problems. Again, I'm not a policymaker and I'm not a policy wonk. So I, I can't say like, this is how everybody should be doing it. Because first of all, geography and regionality is hugely important and every region is different. But what I do know is that here we are uniquely suited to raise ruminants on grass. Like that's what this ecosystem evolved to do that with buffalo and antelope and deer. This land needs that. Large ruminants are keystone species and they're hugely important to the health of the soil. And again, because we get so little rain, which you, you know, I feel like there's kind of this misnomer that like cattle or ruminants in general, are, you know, need a lot of water and therefore places that are drought prone shouldn't have cattle. But the reality is that they are fertilizing the ground as they're, you know, passing through. And if you don't have that fertilizer, plants can't thrive here in the same way. Like the grass will still grow, but it won't grow as well. It's not like in a forest where we've got leaves falling down and decaying and turning into fertilizer. That's not happening here. And, you know, even with the grass, it's healthier for the grass to get eaten down as things are sort of passing through and fertilizing as they go. So that being said, I mean, it's really hard to just always have the answer. It's complicated, <laughs> but it's complicated. And this is why I really shy away from saying this is what you should do, you consumer at home, or have like a call to action, mm -hmm. even though I think that's what people want. But again, like I, I feel like I'm not an expert in the field. So the best I can do is say, if you look at what the ecosystem is in any given location and what it evolved to support, to me, when you're looking at regenerative agriculture, that's sort of like what it is. It's about figuring out how you can create food in a way that allows that ecosystem as a whole to thrive. And for us here, regenerative agriculture looks like having large ruminants and there's better and worse ways to do it. And so we've experimented a lot with rotational grazing and it's a work in progress. I mean, again, there's new science kind of coming out about this and there's, you know, sort of practices that are more tried and true. And I'm sure in 10 more years, they'll be saying something different. I'm assuming that our knowledge will keep evolving, but to me, the whole idea of regenerative or holistic is another way to describe it, is to just be thinking about, you know, not just like, what's the most grains of wheat I can raise or the most cattle I can raise, and that being your focus. Although, ironically, it seems to be that the more you are considering the whole 
system, that actually is going to produce more in the long run because, you know, you might not get as much production at the beginning, but over time, that's going to be sustainable because that's what this particular soil and your amount of precipitation and all those different factors, that's what the system is going to be able to support. So, I mean, that makes me really happy that yeah. that's sort of the evolution of thinking. And I think it, that's the direction we're going in. You mentioned Gabe Brown. And for anybody listening that's, you know, interested in, you know, what is regenerative agriculture and a really good explanation or example, his book is really good. And he ends up demonstrating exactly what you just said when you embrace these principles about your location and your soil, then what you end up doing is being a whole lot more successful or at least he was, and he has spent a career teaching others how to do it. So that's a great book to read, Gay Brown's. Isn't it called Dirt to Soil? Yes, that sounds right. Yes. Something like that. We'll double check that. You mentioned Michael Pollan's Omnivore's yeah. Dilemma, and you said that's where it all started for you. It's the same for me, the same. I, I remember like one of our kids was in college and we picked him up at the airport and riding home from spring break. And I just remember this scene. He said, hey, I just read a book you'd be interested in. It's by Michael Paul and it's called The Omnivore's Dilemma. And I read it and I just really think for my husband and I both, it really was the beginning of something. It just really opened our eyes to you know, mainly what was going on in the food system. And it just, yeah, it really kicked something going in us. So that's yeah. something we have in common. I imagine that's the case for a lot of people, too. That book is a real landmark. Quite an important book for our times. Mm -hmm. So we would love to hear your thoughts, literally or metaphorically, on the good dirt and what it means to you. Again, the work of Gabe Brown, for example, and other people who are working specifically with the sort of science of soil health. Healthy soil represents that there's a diversity and a multiplicity of sources that are creating the soil. but for me, as a songwriter and writer, it is more metaphorical. And again, back to regenerative agriculture, for me, it is more spiritual, I guess, than scientific. And so at the risk of delving into sort of a morbid topic, I mean, I fell in love with these animals that we have and, you know, these baby lambs, like I've been saying. I get very attached to them in a, like a human mother kind of a way, but a lot of them die because when they're born, you know, if they're born with a birth defect or, you know, one of the reasons maybe their mother can't raise them is because something wrong. And so it's part of the process is like facing death a lot more. And similarly, when you're raising animals that are going to be food, you have to face death in a very different way, which is very painful. <laughs> so for me, when I think about, good dirt now. Part of what it is, is it's new life. It's things that you have loved, people, animals, returning to the earth, and then being born again. You know, and a lot of my writing practice, that's like a theme that I keep returning to because I feel like on a really immediate and physical level, that's what I'm constantly experiencing. And so the pain and loss, I'll have a baby lamb, it's in our house. I'm like battle feeding it. I'm caring for it. And now 10 years in, I can kind of recognize, okay, this is probably not going to turn around. Like there's something bigger wrong here than is going to be solved by nurturing. And then I have to take it out, set it on the ground. And especially when they're just newborns, it's like their bodies really do almost just melt back into the soil. And then the grass grows and like the other sheep are eating it. Maybe that sounds creepy, but I actually find that unbelievably reassuring. And there's a spirituality to that. However, it is that you want to conceive of it, because I think, you know, it's different for every person, the idea of, of birth, rebirth and death, like how that resonates. But for me personally, that's when I think about the soul of the land and the spirit of the land. It is all of us and it is all of this that's going down into the ground and then back up from the ground. And, and like that rise and fall is really, really powerfully important to me as a human who is, you know, scared of dying and scared of <laughs> losing people that I love and losing animals that I love. So yeah, to me, that's what good dirt is. Good dirt is a dirt that receives death and brings it back to life. That is so beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I love hearing all the different answers to that question. It never ceases to amaze me how many different interpretations of that. And it's always it's just wonderful. And I just, I love that so much, Eliza. Thank you. It's really comforting. I think of um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. You know, that's in the Bible. I mean, that's like, that's just fundamental. 
so, and this is the reason I reached out to you in the first place, because I'm actually working on a book right now that's going to be, well, hopefully, I don't know, it may take me 10 years to write, but like, it's an almanac. And that's one of the lo- things I'm looking at is spiritual traditions in general, but specifically at Christianity, because that's the tradition I was raised with, that as we've, you know, become more urbanized and suburbanized as a people, that we still have a lot of these rituals and traditions that we don't yeah. even realize are are actually land based and that our spirituality is actually like rooted in the soil. It's in the Bible and it's part of that tradition, but we don't talk about that part as much. So what I'm working on now is really trying to craft something that is, you know, looking at seasonality and looking at the holidays specifically, you know, a lot of them that we're already familiar with, looking at those roots. And then, you know, specifically for where I live on the Northern Plains, obviously, again, it's different for different places. So like finding a way to sort of negotiate the traditions that we already have and to revitalize them again with this mentality, I think that we've gotten separated from the soil and we need to get back to it. I feel comfortable making that claim. Most of us dig in physically and like literally dig into the dirt and also metaphorically. So, oh, that resonates so much with Lady Farmer and the stuff we do. I and mean, I don't know if you heard a couple of weeks ago, we just, we did a podcast on Bridget. Yeah, I read that. And that was great because I was reading all this stuff about her. I actually just interviewed this Episcopalian priest who is in Rapid City. He's a super cool guy, but he was raised in a farming community in Minnesota. And he was talking about this pagan friend he has and how that feast day of St. How do you pronounce it? It's Bridget or Brigitte or Bride. It's said many different ways, but Bridget most commonly, I think. And he was saying that that feast day, he and his pagan friends sort of joke that that's like the feast that they can share across their two traditions. <laughs> I disagree, though. I think there's more yeah. overlap than he was giving their credit for being. But that's a perfect example of like a tradition that actually is really rooted in agriculture. I mean, we call her the ultimate lady farmer. She's the patron saint of lady farmer. When you were describing your work with the lambs, I thought, oh, that's Bridget. You know, that's, you know, she assists in the birthing of the lambs and she takes care of them. And she's a really prominent figure in our work in combining everything about, you know, coming back to the land. And as you explained, there's the science and then there's all this other piece of it. In closing out, what is it that you most (laughs) want people to understand about your life and work? Oh, boy. I think the reason that makes me feel a little nervous to say anything is because I I feel nervous to proclaim anything as my own. (laughs) Every idea I have is an idea I read from somebody else and I'm, you know, synthesizing it or whatever. So I don't want to claim it as like my work, but I feel like the most important thing I have to offer the conversation, the greater conversation is what I've just described, which is again, looking at the poetry of soil and looking at the spirituality of food production. I mean, it's combining two things we haven't had to grapple with for a while. But again, you can look at the Psalms. I mean, the Lord is my shepherd. It comes up a lot. And it comes up because these are themes that are very integral to human nature and nature in general. And I think that, you know, right now we are at a very scary time with climate change and as you know, I, I don't know what's going to happen next and I don't have a solution for that. But the best I can offer in my tiny little corner that I occupy here is to let yourself fall in love with the world in general and especially with the natural world. And that if you see the world as your lover and the natural world as your lover and your beloved, you're not going to do bad things to it. <laughs> if I can write a song or write a story that allows someone to see it the way I see it, that maybe that can help to create that shift. Yeah, totally. And Eliza, where can people find your work and your music and your writing? I have a poorly maintained website. Uh, elizablue.net I think there's pretty much links to everything there you can buy the book from there and you should be able to find music and videos and things like that I think you're on Spotify I think I found you on Spotify I am okay are you on Instagram I am on Instagram like I said every once in a while I think about trying to curate it better but mostly it's just pictures of my kids and like I see when I'm walking around it's not as beautifully as it could be 
No shame in that game. Well, this has been such a delight, Eliza. I'm so excited to be connected with you, and I want this to continue. I think we have a long future of collaboration ahead of us. I'm really excited. Thank you for tuning in, calling in, and spreading the good dirt. We love hearing from you. You can reach our listener voicemail at 443-459-1950. That's 443-459-1950. You can find this number in our show notes and in our Instagram profile. This show is produced by Lady Farmer, a slow living lifestyle community. And the original music is composed and performed by John Kingsley. For more from Lady Farmer, follow us on Instagram at WeAreLadyFarmer. That's We Are Lady Farmer. Or join us online at www.ladyfarmer.com. We'll see you next time on The Good Dirt. Goodbye.